thanks everyone for for coming to uh, the session today. Uh, we're really lucky to have Christopher from uh, Anoma here to to talk to us um, about what he and his uh, team have been working on. So uh, without further ado, um, take it away, Christopher. Thanks, and thanks for inviting me. I hope I can provide something interesting. Uh, so I uh, I prepared two presentations for you today, uh, which are focused on the two components of Anoma that I think are most interesting from a kind of applied ZK cryptographic perspective. The first presentation is on uh, a component called Taiga. Uh, and I'll just, Taiga is kind of our, our private state transition or shielded state transition framework. And I'll describe a little bit about what that is context for why we're building it and explain how it works. And I have a bunch of diagrams of like data flow because it's a, it's a bit intricate. So I'm hoping to spend some time there and maybe uh, you know, see if it, see if this will be a test for me also of explaining this project to someone outside our like company, you know, cult. So uh, uh, it would be good to test whether it makes any sense. And the second presentation I have for you is on a uh, language called Vampire, which is a, an intermediate representation for polynomials that we're hoping can be of service and, and a compiler that we're hoping can be of service to both Anoma and also you know, other projects and ecosystems just as a kind of reusable compiler component to help reduce some of the fragmentation in the ZK tooling space. Of course, you know, st start with fragmented languages and add one language. Now you have n plus one fragmented languages, but uh, uh, I'll make my pitch as to why Vampire might not uh, uh, be that kind of thing yet again. Um, and then finally, I'm just going to give a shout out to we have the CK benchmarking project that we'd love to either invite contributions or forks or or, or sort of a mimesis of. So we'll talk about that briefly. But please go ahead, you know, these are slides, but uh, go ahead and stop me. And I can also, both of these projects have code, which is publicly accessible. So I can also jump to specific parts if it would be helpful to go over things. So we can see how it goes. But I'll go ahead and kick this off just by uh, talking a little bit about the Anoma architecture and Taiga. And tell me if you can see this. Okay. Yep, we can see it. Okay, so basically said that already. Uh, and first, I should give credit both Tiger and Vampire are sort of built by uh, part of the Innova project, and they're built by Heliax, which has about 45 people, including maybe uh, sort of 10 cryptographers or cryptography adjacent researchers and engineers. Uh, spread out spread out across uh, North America, Europe, and a few peppered in Asia. So this is not just my work. Uh, credit to everyone at HDX. Taiga is an architecture for private counterparty discovery and settlement. And this, uh, it, in uh, our conceptualization of Anoma, we use a little bit of a different uh, frame for thinking about what problem we're trying to solve. So I'm first going to explain what that is um, and why we like to think about things this way. Uh, so if we go through a bit of the history of distributed ledgers, uh, we started out with Bitcoin, uh, what we call generation one, um, back with you know, Satoshi's white paper that everyone knows. And Bitcoin had already already a simple form of programmability, maybe more than it got credit for, uh, but uh, at least uh, I like to call this scriptable settlement. So uh, Bitcoin had uh, a UTXO-based system that was not private, uh, did not involve any CK snarks or fancy cryptography, but that did allow uh, some level of programmatic unlocking conditions. So no state, but you could create UTXOs that were locked to particular timestamps or particular scripts uh, that you could express in Bitcoin op script, which is pretty limited, but could do some things. Um, mm -hmm. Then along came Ethereum and many kind of uh, riffs on Ethereum, which have changed uh, have, have, have made it, tried to make it faster or different in various ways or change the account model or other things, but in all cases still falling into the general category of what I call programmable settlement. So in programmable settlement architectures, um, there's a very flexible uh, state machines, so usually one which has programmable contracts uh, and mutable state that could be read or written. So you have flexible expressivity for building other things, including rollups. Um, Ethereum, Cosmos, Solana, and here, all of these projects fall into this category. Um, these are, and, and critically, um, all of these are still doing settlement. So what do I mean by settlement? Settlement happens when you have a transaction and you want to order it, or you want to order many transactions, which might use 
shared resources together on a single ledger. Uh, and settlement um, can be made private pretty easily. Uh, this was pioneered by Zcash, uh, with the Zcash blockchain supporting the just, just Zec asset, and not a lot of programmability. It's kind of like Bitcoin in private, uh, but it provides really strong privacy to observers of the settlement layer. Uh, it's easy to provide privacy in settlement um, because once you have a transaction and you know all of the state transitions that are going to happen, you can kind of you know represent your state in some like zk friendly way like notes uh, and you could just provide a proof that the state transition satisfies whatever invariance you want to be satisfied uh, and the actual like state transition basically is, is computed and proved off the blockchain and you just submit a proof that is correct um, however settlement is not sufficient uh, Settlement only happens when there are many parties, only can happen when there are many parties who already know who they are and what they want. So if we think about, uh, uh, this is sufficient for just sending money. So if we think about sending money, I want to send money to I'm Alice, I want to send money to Bob. Um, I need to know Bob's address, the amount, but that action is unilateral, it doesn't require a counterparty. Um, but many more complex applications, including many applications that are used on uh, ledgers like Ethereum today also, try to do something that looks like what we call counterparty discovery. So counterparty discovery is where um, I have something like an asset, let's call it A, or you know, it could be capability, whatever. I want something else, let's call it B. And I would like to find somebody to be my counterparty. Uh, and uh, here uh, we use the term counterparty, which has, you know, to some people, maybe this has the association of like a trusted third party, but that's not what I mean. By counterparty, I mean someone else. I have some thing, right? some capability with respect to the ledger. So the ledger says that I own like this uh, token and I would like some other thing that somebody else has. I may not know who has it. And critically in this case, I don't really care who has it, but I care about the thing which I might possibly be getting. So uh, when you think about things in this like general fashion, most, I think it would be fair to say, applications on Ethereum take this form. So if we think about, uh, let's see, do I have some examples here? Yeah, if we think about something like Uniswap. With Uniswap, your counterparty uh, is kind of is, is mediated by the block, or counterparty discovery is mediated by the blockchain directly. So you there are LPs providing liquidity into Uniswap, and you, as somebody tra trading, are uh, using the state on the blockchain to figure out uh, who your counterparty is. It's a little bit indirect because LPs are kind of treated as one amorphous entity. You don't interact with one of them individually. Uh, but it's still mediated all through transactions oh, on the blockchain. Um, then with uh, something like OpenSea or a lot of um, uh, sequencers, counterparty discovery is done through a single operator database. So if you use OpenSea, uh, which historically settled trades using a protocol called Wyvern, now I think they have their own called Seaport. Um, OpenSea runs a database of orders for NFT purchases uh, you can post bids and asks, I think they could do auctions, maybe other stuff. Uh, so you're using basically the database operated by the company to discover your counterparty. And then once you've discovered a counterparty, the transaction is posted to the blockchain. So OpenSea doesn't custody the assets, but they custody the liquidity. Uh, you could think of it like this. Um, and in particular, when you do um, uh, counterparty discovery uh, on the blockchain or with a single operator database, you're not really getting privacy. So if you're doing, um, even if you have private settlement, if you do counterparty discovery with you know, OpenSea in their database, and then they make a ZK proof of the NFT trade or whatever, you're not getting any sort of privacy to them. Uh, so, you know, uh, I guess our, our, our way of thinking about things is that privacy is hard, and systems are only going to be as private as their weakest link. So if most blockchain applications really are going to do counterparty discovery in addition to settlement, then we don't even want to bother just only solving the privacy problem for settlement because it's just going to move, you know, the data, the point of data extraction and surveillance capitalism is just going to move to counterparty discovery. So we might as well like go all the way in one fell swoop. Uh, that's basically what we tried to do with the Um Yeah, so there are all these like, like fragmented approaches basically to counterparty discovery, which aren't unified into any sort of programmatic method um, and don't provide any privacy. Uh, and we are, trying to fix both of those problems with something that we call an intent-centric architecture. So in- Can I ask an 
ask yeah, a yeah. question on the previous slide. You had um you had roll up operator, I think, as one of the examples of a single operator database for how do you think about roll ups and roll up sequencers in the context of like counterparty discovery? Right. Um, so I, the roll-up sequencer is not directly your counterparty, like OpenSea is not directly your counterparty, but they're mediating discovery of your counterparty if your counterparty is in another transaction or partial transaction, which is sent to the sequencer. That's what I mean. So um, when if the sequencer is ordering, and in particular if it is uh, like often sequence, you know, there are many different specific approaches and I can't comment on all of them, but often sequencers take transactions from users with signatures from users, and then they combine them together in a way which could involve reordering them or could involve um, like simple, like combining them together and posting them as one blob to save on gas fees, stuff like this. Sometimes you may not, a sequencer is not the same thing as OpenSea. I mean, sometimes the assets that you're interacting with are not, uh, uh, they're not they're not being provided by other transactions in the same batch or something like this. Um, but you're still uh, subject to uh, you know whatever the sequencer chooses in terms of ordering. And if the sequencer is mediating discovery of like uh, parties to you know batch or transactions list even just to save costs, then you lose privacy to them. So I see. Thanks. Yeah. So, so in their orderings of the transactions, they can have an impact on sort of the counterparty discovery. Right. So, uh, um, to be clear, that this is related to the problem of like sequencer MEV, but I, that's not quite what I'm talking right. about. I just mean that um, even if we have private settlements, so suppose that the sequencers were making a zk proof, and they could post the proof to the blockchain when you settled the like combined set of roll-up transactions, right? Uh, if the sequencer has to make the, all the proofs, then you lose privacy to them, even if yep. you private to observers of the blockchain. That's all sure. That's like central distinction. Cool. Um, yeah, actually I should just pause here. Are there other, other questions so far? Um, so, in the architecture of Anoma, we try and incorporate this uh, feature of counterparty discovery in a kind of more native or, or kind of programmatic way, uh, which is what we call intent centricity. So, in an intent centric architecture, there are two phases to, um, I don't know, <laughs> from when a user signs something to when they read a result back from the system, right? That's basically the loop that we care about. User signs something, they click send in MetaMask, then later on they read some state, hopefully through a light client instead of a block explorer, but you get my drift. Um, uh, from when a user signs something to when they read state in the Enoma architecture, there are two phases which the architecture takes as first class which are counterparty discovery and settlement. And settlement is the thing which you're used to. So settlement is where there's a transaction and we post the transaction to a blockchain uh, and users read the state back. That's easy. All the blockchain institutes order the transaction and privacy is straightforward. The thing which is new and kind of interesting from a privacy standpoint is the first phase of counterparty discovery. So in counterparty discovery, instead of crafting transactions, users are crafting what we call intents. Uh, you can think of intents as you know roughly synonymous with partial transaction. So intents are binding programmatic commitments to preferences, which basically looks something like I have A and I want B, and I'm going to give you a diagram in a later slide that is less hand wavy, I promise. But um, we have a, a sort of peer-to-peer -peer gossip network for these intents. So just like you can think of this as like a mempool, but for the stage prior to transactions. So you know, transaction mempool gossips around transactions between validators, full nodes, maybe searchers, other people who are interested in them. These transactions generally, in like you know, typical mempools, are uh, already valid. So you could post them to the blockchain and settle them. It's up to a proposer to include them in a block, or it's up to someone building a block to include those transactions. The architectures can become more complicated, but the transactions are complete. Intents, by contrast, are not complete, so they are not valid alone. Uh, rather, intents are broadcast around this network, and they are eventually discovered by solvers, whose job it is to find compatible intents and use them to create transactions. Uh, so, for example, if a solver finds an intent that says A for B and an intent that says B for A, they can combine those because they balance, or so to speak, 
and that becomes a valid transaction, which then goes to the separate. There is a separate transaction mempool, but I'm not going to talk about it because it's not anything new. Uh, but that transaction then can be uh, just settled uh, in the conventional sense. Uh, um, another question for your prior slides, okay. just make sure that I understand correctly. So uh, when you are broadcasting in this P2P network, you are broadcasting this commitment or the like, uh, yeah, because it seems like if uh, it's just commitment to those intents, then like, I don't know like how solvers can find those because it's commitment and they don't see anything outside. Um, or you mean maybe, uh, this, like, you know, it's partially uh, committed. Like, you know, I I still review, like I want, I have A, I want B, but maybe the concrete, like I want how much A and how much B and uh, that's encrypted in this commitment or, yeah, because I just don't know like who can, because I, uh, if, someone this software can create transaction to bundle maybe two transactions like a, a to b b to a then at least he need to see like whether those transactions are yeah, valid yeah. if it's all binded in this commitment and how he can create such a stuff sorry i guess this uh it's a good question i i'm using the term commitment in a slightly different way which means that uh it's a it's not there is also a commitment in the in the zk sense um in taiga but in the architecture commitment just means that the process is non-interactive so that the user has already provided a signature which commits them to accepting the final results of the transaction if it satisfies the preferences which they expressed so i say like a for b is it's it's i want to contrast this to systems that are like rfq systems where you say like i want this thing but you don't actually commit to trade to that trade you're just using it to discover someone who you will then talk to and you will then actually agree to the trade uh anoma is not such a system so this is uh by contrast but when you make an intent it's like i have a here's a proof that i have a i want b and here's a signature that says if you can find b then i authorize sending my a to whoever gives me b so in that sense it's binding in a commitment um, oh i see but, but, separate yeah. than the... but does this have any privacy here like because it seems like you reviewed your intents and uh, like yeah, or you mean privacy licensing because you didn't choose specific like counterparty to, to trade or whatever. It seems like everything is reviewed here, right? Um, right, well, that's the interesting question. So uh, <laughs> let me just say that my next three slides, we'll talk about that. So okay, maybe I'll okay. just go, uh, but but yeah. So as you, as you already already uh, know, I guess, so you know, why bother listening to me? But um, privacy and settlement is easy, but privacy and counterparty discovery is not. And especially in, uh, in this world of non-interactive counterparty discovery, where parties want to find each other, they need to provide sufficient information that solvers can know when and how two intents can be matched and how to create the transaction which matches them. Uh, so uh, there's a there's a sense of but but it's not there is some um, uh, uh, intermediate point here that is possible and that seems to us to be interesting. In particular, it's still possible to hide identities. And it's possible to do uh, sort of who I am or like my my account is not revealed, only the asset is revealed and the conditions uh, under which I want my intent to be matched, which I would be, uh, which I accept in settlement. Uh, and that, that privacy is possible. So user privacy is possible. And um, it's possible to do partial solving or partial, partial matching. So uh, if we think of, Maybe it's just easier if I have a diagram. Let's try what I this. Um, yeah. Let, let me just get to the diagram and then I'll explain partial solving. So we're we're interested in providing uh, a sort of good modicum of privacy that still preserves the ability of parties crafting these intents to find each other and of solvers to create transactions <laughs> which uh, match them. Uh, right, so the basic high level data flow here is that users will create intents. Those intents are sent around the gossip network. They're found by some solvers. Solvers are not a, they're not in, they're not like a, there's no PKI for solvers. They're not like validators or something. There's no specific permission set. Just any node that sees intents can uh, match them if those intents are compatible. And this can happen in cycles until we get a final valid transaction which can be posted to the blockchain. 
So in Taiga, we want to, basically we want to achieve two kinds of privacy. Uh, we want to achieve user privacy, so the I think of it, the addresses of users will not be revealed, and we want to achieve this kind of partial solving privacy. And partial solving privacy means that when we have, let's say here we have three intents um, uh, involving stars, dolphins, and trees. And uh, you can also call these A, B, and C, and the basic idea of partial solving privacy is that if we have two intents, one of which is A for B, star for dolphin, and one of which is B for C, dolphin for tree, we can combine these into an intent that is A for C, star for tree. And a subsequent party in the gossip chain which sees this intent will know that, you know, there's an intent which trades star for tree, but they won't know whether someone wanted to trade star for tree or whether it came from some prior partial solving which already occurred. Does that make sense? So what is that blue one, yellow one, and green one? Okay. So I should explain a little bit about the inner structure of Taiga. Um, how many people here are familiar with maybe Zexi or Verizexi or some derivative of these systems? I think some people are, some people are not like, yeah. Okay, um, so Taiga uh, provides, uh, as the framework at least, provides both data privacy and function privacy in a uh, manner, you know, still along the original zero cache research lineage. So state is split into notes, uh, and there's a note commitment tree. Uh, notes can be spent once, and in order to spend a note, you must uh, uh, prove that you know the commitment, that you have the authorization to spend it. In our case, you must prove that the predicate along with that note is satisfied, and you must reveal the nullifier, which is added to the nullifier set, and future transactions cannot uh, spend the same note, revealing the same nullifier, or they will be considered invalid. Um, so when we want to represent things like tokens in this framework, you know, if we have um, star, dolphin, and tree, those would all be individual notes, which are initially owned in this example by Alice, Bob, and Charlie, respectively. And in the transaction, we check this balance condition. So if you think of, let's see, so if you think of Zcash, Zcash has one asset. Uh, the circuit is written with one asset or one function in the language of data privacy and function privacy. And that function checks the balance of Zec. There's also a transparent part, but I'm just gonna not talk about this for now. Uh, and basically in a shielded to shielded transaction, that function checks that uh, some notes were spent, some notes which were created. It checks that the sum of the value created is equal to the sum of the value destroyed, so that no uh, tokens are created or destroyed on that. Um, and we do uh, the same thing in Taiga, except that instead of there just being one asset or one uh, data type, the linearity of which we care about, there are many. Um, in particular, uh, we uh, do a sort of content addressed asset type derivation scheme. So hmm, how to describe this? Uh, in each node, there is a predicate, uh, similar to like how Zexi has birth and death predicates for each, each node type, there is a predicate describing how nodes of that type can be created and how nodes of that type can be destroyed. And when we do this balance check, we derive the value basis for the balance check, which is sort of independent generators, uh, which we can check for morphic balances of, um, we check that those balances independently sum to zero. So if I have a, concretely, if I have a transaction which involves a star, a dolphin, and a tree, the balance checks will check that if one star was destroyed, one star was also created. If one dolphin was destroyed, one dolphin was also created. If one tree was destroyed, one tree was also created. Does that help? So you mean those nodes is a predicate function similar to what Zexi have for spending and uh, receiving, like for, for Alice, you, you, you are spending a, a star and want a dolphin, and uh, you, you encode that in that node, and, uh, and uh, you can maybe derive some like homomorphic commitment of balance from that to either check the balance, and that's part of the predicate, mm -hmm. 
Like, you know. um, uh, yes, that's right. Uh, I mean, it's the same. It's the same like state architecture as sexy, pretty much. Um, what <clears throat> is sorry, different sorry. is, yeah. Yeah, I I want to follow up on that question. So, um, in your use case, you have only one predicate. Then why and do you still do the two layer recursion as in Zexy? Because now you kind of don't have a a birth and death anymore, and you don't have a you don't need the functional privacy, right? Or is that it's uh, not, it's um, not one predicate? Um, Uh, sorry, can you please repeat? So it's not one pre one predicate. You. Uh, no, I guess I was just trying to explain how the value balance check works. Um, but uh, each that there are different um, types, and like in Zexy, a type corresponds to uh, or is derived from a creation, a birth predicate, and a death predicate. Uh, we call them different things, but that's what it maps to in Zexy. Um, and we want to check a balance of those types independently. So there are different different functions, uh, but we rather than checking, um, yeah, I guess you could do something where you wanted to check their balance in a combined way, but we want to check their balances independently. I see. So, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I'm trying to ask the 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 difference or the delta between. What you are proposing and the Zexy is that the Zexy has two predicates and now you have only one predicate. Is that a, a reasonable answer? Um, that is uh, that is not really an important difference. Okay. Uh, at the moment, we have one predicate, but it gets a bit as to whether it's being created or destroyed. Um, I, I think the important difference from this architecture in Zexy is how partial transactions work. OK, OK. And I mean, you could, you know, it, if you took what's in the sexy paper and did a lot of work to kind of, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to say that this is like, um, maybe it's better to think of this as this is us figuring out how to kind of instantiate sexy for the model in which we wanted to use it. Um, and we have different, uh, you know, different engineering requirements. Um, it, it, it provides data privacy and function privacy and structure state in the same way. And okay. I don't know if all of the exact um, you know, we might derive asset types in a slightly different way, but it's probably not an important conceptual difference. All right, cool. Thanks. The difference that I want to explain a bit, though, is this sense of um, uh, partial transactions and total transactions. So basically, the difference in Taiga, uh, in what makes uh, what between partial transactions and total transactions or final transactions is that final transactions satisfy the balance criterion and partial transactions don't. And partial transactions correspond to these intents. So if we think of what Alice is doing when Alice authors an intent and broadcasts it on the network, Alice has some um, asset, we'll call it star, and Alice wants a dolphin. Let's, what's tricky in the private world as opposed to the transparent world uh, is that we're operating in this model where state is node. So Alice wants an asset of type dolphin, but there are many dolphins, and Alice doesn't know which of them she's going to get. So she can't make a proof if we want, Al Alice wants to you know, be able to receive this thing privately, but we, she can't make a proof uh, of the dolphin node or whatever, because she doesn't know which one it is. She can only, the only thing Alice can do um, is send her star. And she can't even send her star to somebody because she doesn't know who's going to get it yet. Um, so for this purpose, we use this like partial transaction uh, staged composition pipeline. So first, Alice creates uh, Alice's partial transaction. I'll sort of circle this with my mouse here. And Alice's partial transaction spends the thing which she has, star, um, and it spends it to what we call uh, an intent predicate. So an intent predicate is kind of like, uh, I guess you could think of it as a temporary application that lives only in the duration of this transaction creation process. Uh, but it, it's not like a smart contract that's deployed to the blockchain. It's never kept in any sort of registry. But Alice uses this intent predicate to express her settlement conditions. So she wants the final transaction to be valid, which will spend her uh, star only if she gets a dolphin. And she knows what dolphin, she knows like the asset type for dolphin. 
but she doesn't know which specific dolphin she's going to get. So Alice like creates this partial transaction that spends her one note of star, creates another note uh, with this like temporary intent validity predicate that says that in order to balance that note, uh, to, to like spend a note of that uh, type, someone has to send Alice a dolphin. And Bob and Charlie do this respectively with their assets. They have dolphins, and trees, uh, then a solver. So a solver, which sees in this step three, we have two solvers in this example. So step three is the first solver, sees Alice's partial transaction, um, and it can send uh, Bob's dolphin to Alice um, and satisfy part of the constraints. And then it can create this new partial transaction and forward it to the second solver, who can combine it with Charlie's partial transaction and satisfy all of the constraints in the final transaction. Does that make sense? Um, you probably are going to mention this uh, later in the slide, but I'm really curious to know that uh, how you're going to solve the concurrency issues uh, in the Dexy. Um, right. So I would describe the primary, um, uh, we, we don't solve the, I mean, you have to choose a place to order things if you want dependent state updates to be ordered. Uh, I guess we're primary interested, primarily interested in cases where what users want can be specified in independent ways. Uh, so this is not like for an AMM or something like this. But you can express, because intents are cheap, you can express um, the economics of creating a bunch of intents are different than the economics of creating a bunch of transactions. So like limit order DEXs, when you have to publish everything, everything to the blockchain, are pretty expensive because it's a lot of transactions and most of them aren't going to get matched. But intents don't require fees. They only require fees on settlement. So you could create many different limit orders with different expiries and different price ranges. So, this way. so if I understand correctly, so um, um, so there's still a competing uh, or raising condition where, say, two nodes tries to modify the let's say the the stars at the same time. But you are saying that because the intent to modify this star is cheap, um, I mean, if one of the node fails, then he can just generate another one like a, a with at, with almost no cost. Is that is that right? Yeah. So so you you do you still execute the things serialize, execute the things in serial, but uh, because the because you don't you don't actually go through the proof, the whole proof generation uh, mechanism, so you don't. Uh, I mean, uh, it's still fine. It's it's fine that some of the transaction gets rejected. I mean, from the yeah, from, um, not from the user user experience point of view. Uh, I, I mean, some of this is application dependent. So if, um, in general, I guess, in this paradigm, we're hoping that it will be easier to write applications in ways that don't require large amounts of shared states, that it's like completely dependent, like an AMM. Uh, so if Alice wants to do trades, Alice can, Alice might like, have her, um, you know, in the case of a non-fungible token, Alice might have different things that she's willing to trade her star for. And one of those intents, you know, will find a counterparty first, and that one will get matched. And it's possible that many will find counterparties at the same time and that there will be a race condition. Um, but if there's a bunch of price, that's most likely in cases when there's like a bunch of price uncertainty or the assets being traded are, uh, you know, like very popular or something like this. Um, and there, um, instead, what Alice can do, because she has access to predicates, is that she can write a declining price function into her intent. So she'll start by requesting like a very good price that is probably not going to get matched. And then over time, uh, the price that she's willing to accept will get lower and lower down to some threshold. Uh, so there's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, some solver still accepts the execution risk of maybe the two tra competing transactions are submitted at the same time, uh, but Alice can just specify her like execution and price preferences and she doesn't need to worry about the, uh, she doesn't pay the fees for order, yep. if that makes sense. Yep. 
Okay. So, so it is true yeah. that someone has to accept or execute. Yeah, maybe that's a clearer way to answer. Uh, we just offload the execution risk onto these specialized parties called solvers, who at least can deduplicate among their own transactions, uh, and they might, yeah, they might compete with one another. But it depends on the topology of the network. Yep. Cool. Thanks. Cool. Um, so I guess back to your question. Uh, yeah, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, or John. Yes. Uh, what privacy do we provide in Taiga? Uh, we provide identity privacy, but not asset or sort of constraint privacy uh, during counterparty discovery, and we provide full privacy during settlement. This is important, I guess, as a distinction also to mention that in the world of settlement privacy, there is one observer or one class of observer who is an observer of the blockchain. And we only care, like the privacy property is simple because we only care about privacy to that observer. What can an observer of the blockchain see? So when we talk about like Zcash's privacy model or Monero's privacy model or whatever, we're talking about observers of the blockchain. And observers of the blockchain might have different information, but there's still one class of observer. Um, however, when we talk about privacy and counterparty discovery, it's more nuanced because there are many different observers. This counterparty discovery network is sort of sparse. Or, you know, you might broadcast intents if you're concerned about privacy first to your neighborhood solver or your friend solvers and only then, or perhaps never, if you're very concerned about privacy to like the entire network, as there are multiple different observers. Uh, but to those observers, to whomever you broadcast your intents, the assets and constraints are still public. So if you're using very unusual assets uh, uh, frequently, there may be some measure of statistical linkability. But uh, at least we postulate this is more or less the best you can get with non-interactive intent matching like this, because the solvers need to have both the requisite information to test if two intents can be matched and to construct the transaction which actually matches them. So alternatives are you can get more privacy if you do some kind of MPC between the parties, um, uh, or if you do the solving in like FHE, but that seems very unlikely to be practical anytime soon. Future research directions. Uh, so yeah, that's I guess what Taiga is going after. Uh, you can find it on GitHub. Um, it's currently implemented using Halo 2 as a backend. Uh, we've discovered that uh, some Halo 2 uh, plumbing still needs to be put in place. So we're trying to work the ECC team on that. Uh, there's some example predicates, proofs can be created and verified, and we have partial transactions, but please don't use it in production. Uh, so that's pretty much Taiga. Um, I guess pause for questions, and I can talk about Empire. Oh, <laughs> I'm interested to know that the Tiger's performance versus, you know, uh, Zexy and where is Zexy? Uh, do you have any data point? Uh, yeah, currently with, we have four notes. So that you have to pick a fixed constant number. We have four input and four output notes and proving takes two seconds. Wow. Hey, let's you... That's 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 really. Um... It took 18 okay. seconds with Plonk. So Halo 2 was a great speed up. Cool. And this, this is for the for the uh, inner circuit or the outer circuit. The uh, this is for the outer the outer circuit. outer circuit. But the inner circuit proofs can be constructed in parallel, so it's yeah. less like both on a machine, but also we expect that in general they're constructed by separate parties. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. And what I guess actually a question I would ask. So I'm aware of like. There's the Alio has some Zexy derived implementation. Espresso Systems has a Vera Zexy prototype on GitHub. Are there other like production ish implementations of Zexy that you know? Uh, Do you no, know that there's. Yeah. Okay. The, I mean, yeah, the, the Snack VM and uh, also the, the Vera Zexy. So those, those are the two that I'm aware of. Right. Um, cool. So. I guess the second part of this presentation is about this uh, intermediate language that we're building for polynomials called FabIR. So I'm going to switch, maybe. Cool. 
Um, so Vampire uh, is trying to, oh yeah, Vampire uh, by the Vampire team, Joshua Marie and Carlo, is trying to simplify the lives of high-level compiler developers. Um, so uh, our, I guess, our, our process started out here uh, a year ago with trying to write some higher level applications using zero knowledge proof systems, particularly the multi asset shielder pool, and then later Taika, and frequently having to switch which proof system backend those applications were written in uh, because uh, backends improved or backends didn't quite have the performance characteristics we expected or we encountered you know, implementation difficulties. Um, so for that reason, we thought it would be kind of easier if there were one central, uh, slightly more abstract representation that could be easily compiled to circuits. And I want here to contrast, so Vampire is not a ZK DSL. There are lots of great ZK DSLs, uh, and some of them might have internal components, which are which are kind of like Vampire. I don't, I can't say that I know, you know the structure of everything clearly. Um, but Vampire is instead designed already to be an internal component of a ZK compiler stack. And it's designed to be an internal component that is responsible for translating a sort of abstract representation of polynomials uh, corresponding to circuits into a proof system specific representation for many different proof systems. So different proof systems uh, like sort of Planckish, Halo 2, Planck Up, uh, R1CS, Belmar, uh, Bellman, Lebstark, there are others have all support you know the same complexity class of programs and their representations are at least in principle semantic uh, equivalent in power uh, but they're different in specifics so you have to express your constraints as r one cs or as pluckish or to, uh, potentially in some pluckish variants you can use lookup gates there are lots of these sort of uh, specific um, different implementations of Planck have different gate arities, stuff like that. There are all of these proof system specific representation constraints that are, if, if, if you put them in your higher level language, it's just awkward and you have to deal with them separately in each higher level language. And it means your higher level language has to fix a particular proof system um, as opposed to being able to adopt new proof system uh, specific representations. Empire is concerned only with the translation of this abstract uh, polynomial circuit representation to proof system specific representations for different proof system backends. Let me talk a little bit about what that representation looks like. So all the circuits that we're dealing with are uh, circuits and polynomials uh, uh, or have sort of a, a, a one to many correspondence in that uh, the semantics of a circuit are completely captured by a, the poly, by a polynomial, but the circuit contains more information about computation. So you can have two circuits which represent or ha, are, are semantically uh, identical to one polynomial, but they involve a different sequence of gates, right? Um, and those differences in the sequence of gates and in the structure of the circuit uh, can be more or less efficient for different proof systems, different fields, different configurations of other things, depending on, you know, in some peer systems, you know, the ratio of the cost of addition and multiplication is quite different, stuff like this. So in general, we can think of arithmetic circuits as representations of computation paths of polynomials, particularly polynomial verification. You join arithmetic circuits by wiring them together. Uh, and they just, oh, sorry, my slide's being slow here. They correspond to systems of polynomial equations. Uh, confusingly in the slide, it says a squared equals a. Uh, it should say like a naught squared equals a one. That's, they're two different a's. Uh, but this is just an example of a polynomial and a circuit which corresponds to it. I, I'm sure this is like probably straightforward. Um, and often in intermediate representations, we need to represent circuits as expression trees. Uh, so if we think about the circuit as an expression tree, uh, it has some uh, constraints of equality amongst all of the initial values or inputs to the circuit, then these intermediate values at nodes, and then the final input. And often we need to compile this to sort of, some sort of more descriptive list of gates and actual wires at the back end. With Vampire, you can write circuits in this kind of, or polynomials in this high level um, form. So 
So if we think about there, it just looks like function definition, but they're really just aliases. There's no, or no sort of complicated function abstraction going on here. But you can write Booleans, range, constraints, um, division, et cetera. And if we think about a specific example, let's take the Py Pyth Pythagorean game. So in the Pythagorean game, a player uh, of the game submits uh, triple ABC uh, and value S, um, and the um, verifier checks that uh, those that triple has a Pyth Pythagorean relationship so that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And we do this using this extra bit S. You can write that in Vampire like this, Pythagorean um, uh, alias, and you have this just is constraint, which checks whether uh, um, the two bits are equal. Vampire is responsible for compiling. I'll talk about in the subsequent slides a little bit about how this works, but Vampire is responsible for compiling this representation, which you see here, into proof system specific representations. And it tries to abstract that just via three uh, commands, which are probably the ones you would expect, compile, prove, and verify. So you can give a vampire a vampire input file, and it will um, compile it uh, to a backend proof system with specific parameters. Then you can make proofs, and then you can verify the proofs. And you can also import this as Rust library in addition to calling uh, it to be in the command line. So if we look at this example again, here is what parameters look like. So in this case, we're using a sort of plunk, plunkish output. Uh, over the LS 1231 and the Bandersnatch curves. Um, and we have to provide, yeah, when you prove, you provide a witness map. Um, and we, Vampire internally compiles all of this to the uh, specific representation needed at the moment. It's the ZK Garage, Plunkish backend, and Halo 2 backends supported. Um, blah, blah, blah. This just involves AST conversion. Then we need to convert this into normal form, expand it into the specific declarations of inputs and wires and constraints. And uh, tr sometimes we can translate like subtraction to addition, turn it into, in the case of three plunk, we turn it into a set of three plunk constraints. Oh, I should not talk about that yet. Um, that makes sense. So I mean, are you terms... recording, asking questions or? Yeah, you... potentially. Uh -huh. Yeah, so so just one quick question. So when you are writing circuit, you have to write in this high level way and it will compare to your one power IR, which is defined by a lot of expressions and you get some expression tree and uh, you from that expression tree go into RNCS or punky stuff. Yeah. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, so, so um, sorry, this is vampire. So, oh, so this uh, is our on the IR this, level. This, this, is, this is the IR that you write here oh okay. um, i mean in general we expect this I, vampire is like a vampire we think of as being roughly analogous to lvm but for circuits so it's designed more to be an intermediate representation i mean you can write it of course as a human like you can write lvm as a human but most people don't instead they write higher level languages which compile to lvm and lvm solves this very specific problem of translating an infinite register machine into a finite register machine for different finite register machines with different numbers of registers and different like, I don't know, SIMD operations. Like LVM does a lot of stuff, Vampire is much simpler. But similarly, Vampire just tries to solve the problem of translating this abstract polynomial representation with whatever degree poly polynomial you want and these kind of aliases and standard arithmetic operations into specific representations of constraints and circuits which have more restrictive formats like all gates or area three stuff like this so we expect that people will you know in our case we have 
a part of the compiler stack that lives on top of Vampire Heart, and we expect that it might be useful to other folks also building languages on top of Vampire who just want to solve this part of the compilation problem somewhere. Um, just make sure I understand this. So if I want to prove for this this game, like player, like you you prove that those like A, B, C, and S satisfy the relationship. So so because you know previous graph there is a, like dog create all those all those front end language compared to this IR. So do I need to like firstly write all this IR and then like have some compiler from it just, just, just don't know like you know what what are you written in the create and uh, like how it compared to this function if you already have this because it seems, this seems like already contains all the constraints you need for at least for checking this program or you mean maybe there is a larger program and uh, which repeatedly right. have this kind of pattern and you you just use this as error and uh, yeah I just try to figure out like you know what's your like normal sequence for for using that and also like what kind of front end language you you can already support through your error like is that they'll create all those stuff already being supported or um yeah <laughs> i don't know whether that's um, <laughs> yeah express my question clearly or not and also like you know for for this ir stuff for this expression tree uh, it seems like it's still very hard to express lookup permutation which seems to involve more complicated relationship I, I even don't know like how you can make that compatible for rncs and plunkish if rncs clearly don't support lookup and uh, like how you can make that happen. Ah, yes, I see, I see, I see. Um, so, right, so the idea of Vampire is not to, um, it's not translating between R1, CS, and Plunkup. It's only compiling this IR, which is what you see in this picture. So this is Vampire. And the Vampire compiler compiles this IR to um, different specific representations. And in that compilation, it can do optimizations. Uh, for example, you can write something which is, uh, like a lookup gate, and when it, uh, you know, when it compiles to backends that support lookups, it's compiled to a lookup, and when it compiles to R1CS, it just uses the like uh, non-lookup but semantically equivalent check. Uh, and to some extent, we can, you know, as the compiler optimization passes and proves, we can do that automatically. We can't do all of it automatically yet. Um, so you mean there are some way to like you. So, so, so does vampire R support lookup semantics already? Like, just use some other way when comparing to R1CS. Yeah, that's right. Oh, okay. Well, is that some Merkle tree stuff like in R1CS for doing lookup or like? Um, how, how, or, yeah. No, no, no. The the idea is that you write so you write like the thing which you want to generate a lookup gate for in vampire. You write it as in the regular way, not a lookup. But then Vampire can, uh, you know, at the moment with like some instructions to do this when possible, but can generate the lookup table and encode it in um, plug-ish constraint systems for you. So we don't encode the lookup gate in R1CS. Rather, we compile the thing which is not a lookup to a lookup table. Oh, so you mean like when you are writing uh, this IR, you don't indicate that it's lookup, but you just write some other constraints. And if it's Plunk backend, you automatically change to lookup. Oh, so this is quite, yeah. I think the backend seems to be oh, like a bunch of work if you really want to do this optimization well. Do you have any benchmark for comparing with some manually written circuits for maybe something uh, written with Vampire IR? Right, uh, not entirely. I mean, some of the Halo 2 compilation we just got working last week, so benchmarks will take a little bit longer. Uh, we do have, we have a zero knowledge benchmarking project. Uh, it doesn't include all of Vampire's optimizations yet. Uh, I actually have a slide about that at the end, but uh, yeah, your point is well taken. I mean, I think it will take work to get all of these compiler passes uh, working well. Uh, that's most of the work. But I guess the thesis of Vampire is that that work has to happen somewhere, and it's better for it to happen in a kind of in a kind of reusable component that doesn't necessitate any other choices. So, uh, if you you know, as long as your front end language can translate things to the syntax, then the part of proof system specific optimizations 
that part of the compiler transformation passes can always be done like by vampire for your language. So it just makes sense to put it in one place in the compiler stack. Okay. So, so uh, oh. go ahead. Sorry. Oh, uh, maybe like you can finish your questions. I like probably another question about the vampire. Yeah, just want to. Ask, yeah, also I have another. Just another question, not related to like where you are on this like one pair development, and uh, like is that many besides like Noma? Like is there any other projects using this IR to write their circuits? And uh, yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think we're in the like early to mid prototype stage. There's a prototype which supports Halo two and Plunkish as backends. It can compile, prove, and verify. Um, and we're trying to. We're currently uh, working with uh, a little bit with what's it called the um, Triton VM team. Uh, to see if they can use this as well. We don't have our production users yet. So they are using Stark, right? If I remember correctly. Or that's right. Uh, okay. But whether uh, um, the yeah, internal no. encoding choices of a Stark are still compatible with this, it's yeah, just yeah, like yeah, a different yeah. uh, uh, direction of compiling yeah. this. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so my question to the vampire is: that How do you uh, do the layout? Uh, how how do you lay out like different values into columns if it's in a plunk context? So I know like you have this uh, this form like transformation, but there's a one pass uh, potential. You can put those values into share same columns or different columns, kind of layout. Uh, how many columns and how many rows you're going to use? Uh -huh. um, yeah, is it something like the maybe you were expect the developer to expect uh, specify that uh, in in some way like in the front end IR or I don't know like no, the... I mean so, so we we don't have all the optimization passes done, but it's kind of like an area packing problem depending on the specific cost metrics. Um, if I mean I think probably. Uh, at least out of work I'm aware of, Sean and the ECC team in their like Halo 2 API have made the most practical progress towards efficient packing. Uh, and we want to translate that into compiler algorithms instead of manual, manually specified things, but it's not done yet. I don't know. Mm, I see, yeah. At so the moment, I, it's like very simple the... heuristics. It's not, it's not fancy. Uh -huh. Yeah, so my, my thumbs are thoughts like the right now, about this is that you have Redis models when you're specifying the, in the front end language. And then now you need to map mm -hmm. those Redis into limited slots uh, in terms of columns. And then you, if you want to fit into the columns, then you need to have different selectors to turn on and off different custom grids. So yeah, maybe I think this is some like optimization or coloring problem, like optimization problem for the coloring and how many slots you need to have. And there's some trade-off, I guess, you need to play with. Yeah, I mean, one thing we're trying to do uh, is to uh, have intermediate formats that are also compatible with like existing uh, SMT solvers or sort of optimization tools, so that the backend could just come with some cost metrics and we can export it, and then you know, because it's easy to check a quality of circuits. Then when we get some like optimized thing, we can check them as well. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. I think that definitely they're going to be tiered uh, intermediate languages. I think. Cool. Um, so let me then just quickly cover last bit here. Um, so in order to try and uh, evaluate all of these different approaches, um, we've started to do some ZK compiler benchmarking. Uh, at the moment, this repository covers risk zeros, risk five, um, Stark covers uh, ZK garage, Plonk, mine VM, and handle two. 
um, and includes Sudoku and one other example. Sudoku and one other example. <laughs> Benchmarks. I should just click the thing. Um, Yes, uh, if you go to this repository and click on benchmarks, we have uh, Sudoku and Fibonacci uh, compile, prove, and verify times for, uh, and soon Blake, but not with everything. Um, it's very hard to compare. Comparisons tend to be apples to oranges, which makes this problem difficult. Uh, I think until we get like, a sort of clear um, uh, configuration matrix of uh, proof system properties such that you can select a set of properties, uh, like no trust set up or universal trust set up or something, and then you can get a trade off space of uh, prover time, verifier time, proof size, which is usually what people care about. We're not quite there, but at least we have some compilation uh, benchmarks proving and verification benchmarks for some of these systems. So I wanted to share this just because it's like our little effort to try and start to map the territory of how uh, these different approaches compare to one another. Uh, and it's definitely not enough yet. Um, so curious if you know you guys have heard about other benchmarking approaches um, or yeah, you know any systems that would be like ready for it. We tried to include uh, Triton in this as well, but they wanted us to wait. Um, so trying to include more kind of systems for a little bit easier uh, navigation that people try to understand what they could be using. Anyway, uh, also in case you know, we tried to make this repository very easy to contribute to, if people want to submit um, other, uh, uh, either other examples or other backends, uh, instructions on how to do so are all explained here. Do you guys know of other benchmarking attempts? You mean benchmark against different? Proof system, like different. Right. So, okay. What we're trying to do here is take this a same the same example, like a nine by nine Sudoku puzzle, and a circuit which checks that a Sudoku solution for that puzzle is not all the numbers, but a Sudoku solution with some initial set of numbers is valid. And we're trying to implement that circuit or that like um, uh, puzzle in at the moment these four different backends. So, risk zero. Uh, which is just implementation of Rust, compiled to Risk Five, used with Risk Zeros, Prover and Verifier, with Minds VM, with Plunk. I think this is the uh, yeah the ZK Garage Plunk implementation, and with Halo Two. And we want to understand, you know, just for the purposes of comparing these approaches, how long it takes to run the compilers, but most importantly, to generate uh, and verify proofs and how big the proofs are. So this is trying to use the same circuit. So like assuming that we develop the developer care about this particular program, how do these proof systems compare? Yeah, but the performance, I guess, very largely depends on concrete program if you are like, because those two examples are quite simple and you can, you can easily get some benchmark result. But for example, if you're running some hash function, if you use some lookup and in a very nice way, you use some custom gating in a nice way, you definitely can save a lot for, especially for some low level mm -hmm. optimized mm -hmm. library like Halo 2. But for 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 simpler program, like for maybe you can use Rift 5, Maiden, like you just need to verify a very simple execution trace, which might be similar to your program with a VM or circuit or help. But yeah, I think it's still very largely depends on your like circuit shape your application and uh because because if you are using very simple circuit you you are not really unlocking this power for custom gate lookup and all those like magic optimizations um yeah so maybe some like more larger real world like example makes more sense but yeah it's again like it's still very hard to to compare yeah, yeah like, i agree 
it's it's, yeah. it's it's early stage uh, and it's hard to i mean just like even implementing the same circuit in all of these four proof systems took us like two months so yes uh, yes 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 because we are comparing with halo 2 and the plunky 2 which are the two very similar like uh arith arithmetic uh but it's still very hard like even for 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 circuit implementation like different implementation might differ like five or ten times and uh yeah, because because you can't even use the same optimization if you are considering the underlying field are different. For example, like Plunky to use Goldilocks field, which means your witness need to be smaller within this like sixty four bit length. But for 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 Halo two, which you you might use some elliptic curve, which means your underlying field might be larger, like two hundred and fifty six bit four bit or whatever, and so you can use just larger like value as your intermediate value which might might reduce your your size but and also plunky mm -hmm. tool re relies on this recursive to really be performant because if you are talking about only talking about the poor poor time you know like usually plunky tool the first layer is like can be five times faster than halo 2 but the proof size is like one thousand times larger than halo 2 so you need to add up the, the second layer so it's just very complicated to directly do benchmark First from the circuit side, second from the concrete like setup, and yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, this is uh, we we haven't tried Plunky too. I guess we should, but um, this is what we find as well. And I guess it's one reason why we're hoping to find. You know, uh, maybe it's too much to ask people to contribute to Vampire, but I would at least like to. We have this theory that this is the component that makes sense in the zk compiler stack because. Uh, you know, everyone has to do these kinds of passes, and it would be nice if we could duplicate it. Um, and we would, I would be very interested from hearing and hearing from people who either think that they can't use Empire or think that they can and why. Uh, maybe we can improve our hypotheses there. Yeah, I think one can tell you that I do, don't know how to, like, how much work compared with directing rating Halo to circuit. In our case, if you have so many custom gates uh, self-defined compared with using one power and how much developer effort that can save, um, mm -hmm. it was a personal concern from my side. And but yeah, no, I was just gonna ask the, the the benchmark the benchmark numbers that you had on the screen. Um, those are those are not using Vampire. Those are just like. All, all the constraints are directly written and implemented directly in each of the each of the proof system constraint systems, right? That is correct. Okay. Um, we are currently working on adding Vampire to this benchmark suite, um, but it's not there yet. So these are, and then we would do like Vampire in this proof system versus the proof system uh, implemented kind of natively. You can see what the you know, compiler abstraction right. is. Right. So it'd be like another row in each of those tables. Um, yes, and cool. we're also trying to support additional backers. Cool. Yeah, I think like something like a a Ketchak, uh hash function would be a cool benchmark. Although, again, then like your implementation will depend on the specifics of each proof system. But if Vampire like can does this distinction between like lookup table implementations, then Perhaps it can it can work. I don't know. But it, it, it's it's cool to to it's 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 cool that you guys are making an effort to map out the the space because um, you know categorizing things by uh, prover time and verification time and proof size, et cetera. So that's really that's cool. Yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 a drop in a very large uh, space of things which are difficult to navigate unless you understand their internals very well. Uh, so. Yeah. One, you know, I guess like part of our theory though is that it's true that it takes a lot of effort to de develop compiler optimization passes. However, it's still, if we assume that there are going to be many, many zero knowledge programs in the future, um, uh, it, 
is better to develop the compiler optimization passes because otherwise 10,000 developers have to do the same thing, right? Uh, so, you know, you can split things in different ways, but the cost has to be paid at some point. Yep. Cool. Um, anyone else have any more questions for Christopher? All right. Is there anything else you you wanted to to present, Christopher? No, I don't think so. I hope that was interesting. Yeah, this was a a really cool presentation on uh, Taiga and and Vampire, and this benchmark uh, project is is very cool as well. Um, and yeah, I hope I hope the discussion was also, uh, you know insightful for, for for you it was insightful for us for sure so um thanks thanks a lot for presenting appreciate your time and, and preparation so thank you all right um thanks for coming everybody uh, see you later <laughs>